The ASHG annual meeting has been the premier venue for all of the latest in genetics and genomics research for over 70 years. This year, we have finally returned in person in the City of Angels with an unmatched opportunity to reunite and reconnect with colleagues in a warm, diverse, and welcoming city. ASHG TV starts right now. Welcome everyone to the beautiful city of Los Angeles where the 2022 ASHG annual meeting is kicking off with all the latest in genetics and genomics research. My name is Atria Godfrey and I will be your host for the next few days where we will give you exclusive interviews with leaders in the field. We'll take a deep dive into some of the organizations and universities at the forefront of genetics research and we will be highlighting some of the key topics being discussed at this year's meeting. There is so much to cover and we don't want you to miss a minute. Remember, you can always catch the latest episode of ASHG TV on any of the televisions spread throughout the convention center, on the in-house channels at several of our partner hotels, on the homepage of the ASHG website, and of course, always on our YouTube and Twitter channels. Now, we kick off day one by hitting the conference floor to hear from you, the members, about what excites you the most for this year's meeting. Let's see what you're most looking forward to. I'm most excited about the African Genomes uh, session, just because diversity has been such a big issue in genetics for the past few years. So I'm really excited um, that for the first time after the entire pandemic, I get to meet all the people I worked on host genetics of, of COVID-19 with and whom I met um, just virtually and who I have been working with for the past two and a half years. But now is actually the first time that we get to meet in person and we do have an invited session on COVID-19 genetics and what is coming after, after the pandemic. My blood gets pumping when I hear about the volume of the data that we are generating in genomics. Uh, and I, I'm from a national laboratory. Uh, we run big exascale computers. And I'm really here to understand how large scale computing like exascale computing could help gain uh, new insights from the genomics data to make everybody healthier. I'm mostly a statistical geneticist in training, so really excited for some more method development and uh, applications to complex traits, mostly. I'm looking forward to the poster talk session that's happening tonight, because I actually have a session during that, and so I'm looking forward to sharing my work with the rest of the genetics community. Basically, I'm a clinical geneticist, so I'm attending more clinical, and also some cancer, and also, obviously, the, uh, anything about CRISPR or gen treatment or therapy, anything, gene therapy. Some of the plenaries have been followed by really, like, intense debate, some of them, and um, got a lot of a scientist thinking. Uh, so, so certainly this is uh, a really a space that can spark a lot of things going forward, I, I think, yeah. I love connecting with people and speaking and meeting new people, so this is the perfect opportunity for that. Meeting friends, meeting old colleagues, it's just prop my favorite part of ASHG, and that's really what I'm looking forward to this year the most. I am so happy to be at ASHG 2022. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. this is your first time at the meeting, it can sometimes feel a little daunting with just how much is being presented. Well, we got the chance to talk with program chair Dr. Erica Davis to gain a little more insight into what we can expect at this year's meeting. Here's what she had to share. My first piece of advice for newcomers to this meeting is first of all to plan ahead. So we have this amazing online planner that you should use and to plan your day, which sessions are you going to go to, which posters will you attend. It's an amazing tool to help organize your time efficiently. The second piece of advice that I have is to network, meet people, don't be shy, and, and participate in the variety of activities that are available to attendees at the meeting. I can feel the excitement. I just walked into the convention center and the enthusiasm is building. People are arriving. I'm seeing new students as well as 
collaborators and friends who I met at my very first ASHG meeting back in 2006. So it's like a big family reunion. There are over 7,000 registrants here. And I am told that these numbers match or perhaps exceed the last in-person meeting which took place in Houston. So I am delighted that so many people are here after a few years of virtual ASHG meetings. We have an action-packed lineup of plenary talks, platform presentations, posters, and plenty of network opportunities in between. The ASHG as a whole has placed a lot of emphasis on promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. So in particular, I think that building awareness is an amazing priority that we are living, we are exemplifying within our community. Anything from the makeup of the presenters to the major topical areas on underrepresented populations here, to a variety of, of other research on how to include, how to make sure that diversity is promoted within the human genetics community. The theme for this year's meeting is celebrating diversity, but that can mean many different things to many different people. So here to discuss what the research of genomics has traditionally looked like and why the need to refocus are two experts in the field, Dr. Michael Bauer and Dr. Neil Hansford. Thank you both for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start with that, that exact topic. What has genomic research traditionally looked like and who has benefited from it the most? Well, I'd say that, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, uh, traditionally genomics research has focused, especially human genomics research has really focused on uh, um, populations of traditionally European ancestry and focused on the diseases that are very prevalent in those groups. Um, and as a result, um, those groups have probably benefited more, although to be fair, everybody's benefited from human genomics, um, but maybe there's a little bit of inequity in terms of who has benefited more than others. And I see you nodding along, Dr. Bauer. So there has been a need to refocus here a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So like even in my research, when I go to work on different populations and there's just not sequencing available for those people. And so you miss out on those and then you're just like trying to play catch up to recruit and, and build up those resources. So. so why is focusing on diversity, equity and inclusion not only important for research, but for the people that it might benefit? I think, yeah, so we all kind of starting to learn that diverse groups bring different uh, things to a research um, efforts, but in the, it's in the small things that we're missing that to fill in the holes of, of the um, cancer research or whatever it is that uh, can be greatly affected. And is this something that we have maybe been noticing for quite some time? Are we slowly playing catch up here? Yeah, we're, we're sort of like quickly playing catch up after a long time. So <laughs> right. it's, it's, been, uh, it's been something that's sort of um, been underseeding everything for a long time. But I think now we have the realization and now there's been more of an impetus to move towards having more inclusion, uh, having a greater respect for underrepresented groups and having more diversity as being part of our genomics generally. So now we're aware, we know that there is work to be done with regards to this. How do we build or maybe rebuild trust in some of these underrepresented communities? Yeah, I think trust is trust is a tricky thing um, because I think sometimes there's a presumption that there is no trust. And so people don't make the effort to try and engage those groups. Interesting. Um, and so that, that we shouldn't start with that presumption. That's the first thing. I think there are definitely persons and groups for, who are, who, for whom trust is a big issue. Um, and as with trust in any kind of relationship, it's, it takes sort of a, an investment to sort of ensure that those groups are brought along, make sure that, as, that it's not a single deal, right? You're not just doing a research project or a single paper, a single study, but there's a, a longitudinal relationship that's built up as part of that. And then the other big part about trust is people tend to trust people who are from their own communities. So we need to have more representation from these underrepresented groups among the researchers who are as well as the, the cohorts and communities that we're studying. You're nodding along. Yeah, it sounds like uh, long-term collaboration is kind of what's 100 needed. percent agree. I'm a part of the Public Education and Awareness Committee for um, ASHG, 
And we actually had um, some re researchers go out and do interviews with leaders in these different communities. And they saw that addressing that the past harms that were caused by um, some of the uh, testing and mm -hmm. that was done on minorities, but addressing that, but then also educating them on how it can benefit them. And then, like you said, people educating minority students and them to go into the field because they're the best ones to kind of communicate to their families, friends, and their communities. All right, final question for you both. Like I mentioned, this year's meeting theme is celebrating a genetic diversity. What does that mean to each of you? Um, to me, I think it's, uh, we kind of, it's in our diversity that we can build the full picture of the human um, condition or, or whatever. And so we celebrate that, our differences that kind of bring us all together. In the end. Yeah, and I'd also say we celebrate the oneness, right? We're all sort of derived from the same groups and we, we, we have um, many, many common an ancestors in common. And so I think that we have the opportunity to celebrate that in its fullest breath. That means for people everywhere. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for your time this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you. We start our tour today of organizations and universities that are at the forefront of genetics and genomics research. First, we go all the way to Australia to the Center for Precision Health at Edith Cohen University, where they bring together a multidisciplinary group of researchers with specialties across many areas of medicine and data analytics. This diversity provides flexibility and agility with technology suited for understanding the early stages of chronic health conditions and for developing and optimizing treatment. The Center of Precision Health was established at Edith Cowan University in 2021, but what it did was bring together a groups of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary researchers with a common vision of improving the health and well-being of individuals through improved diagnostic, prognostic and personalised intervention strategies. So we're looking at their genetics, we're looking at their epigenetics, as well as glycomics, proteomics, and bringing together that multi-omic approach to understand the individual that has the disease on top of the disease itself. And we apply that model across uh, three different uh, health priority areas. The first is the neurological conditions stream, where we focus on Alzheimer's disease, but also other neurological conditions such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease. In the cancer stream, a strong emphasis is on melanoma research, melanoma being a particular um, prevalent in Australia. And finally, the suboptimal on global health, which is more of a chronic health conditions program. The Center for Novostics and Li Kaxing Institute of Health Sciences at the Chinese University of Hong Kong are both focused on the new applications of circulating nucleic acid as a diagnostic tool. Let's take a closer look. Li Kaxing Institute of Health Science was uh, founded in 2007 as a multidisciplinary translational research institute. It is based in the Prince of Wales Hospital, which is a teaching hospital of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And the Center for Novostics is a center opened under the indo hk scheme, supported by the Hong Kong government, and we're based in the Hong Kong Science Park. So we are focused on the new applications of circulating nuclear acid diagnostic tool. Our program in non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT for short, started with our original discovery back in 1997 that during pregnancy, a fetus would release its DNA into the bloodstream of a mother. By actually taking blood from mother, you are able to actually deduce the genetic makeup of the baby. We have uh, uh, created the first non-invasive prenatal test for trisomy 21, which has now been used all over the world. And actually, we then also see the parallel of that to cancer, because basically, if you can work out the chromosome makeup of a baby, you can also work out chromosome makeup of a cancer. By using that technology, then you can basically detect multiple types of cancer just from a single blood test.
Native Biodata Consortium is the first nonprofit research institute led by indigenous scientists and tribal members in the United States. The bio repository of the NBDC ensures that advances in genetics and health research benefit all indigenous people. NBDC is a indigenous led bio repository and research facility located within the our exterior boundaries of a tribal jurisdiction, the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation. So we have some autonomy from the federal government for data which we're focusing on, which would be Native American data or indigenous data. It puts it under a government that has a Indians or Native Americans as their focus. We feel that the NBDC is positioned to raise the issue, is everybody having an equal benefit? To use the indigenous context and the indigenous history of exploitation, erasure, and disempowerment and say, this will be the case for everybody if you're not using these technologies carefully. Lastly, we head to Primary Children's Center for Personalized Medicine, which is not only using rapid whole genome sequencing to diagnose children's ailments, but also to treat them as well. Let's see how they're doing it. So one of the challenges in uh, pediatric medicine now is that we're just emerging from a phase where it's very difficult to diagnose children. And really the technology over the past five to 10 years has transformed that ability to make diagnoses. And so kind of a big frontier now is for genetic diagnosis. The Heritagene Children's Study is a big study that we're conducting here out of uh, primaries. And the study is trying to look at the genetics and genomics of children's health. It's had a huge impact on the children that I take care of in the cardiac ICU. It's allowing us to make rapid diagnoses. It's allowing us the opportunity to give directed therapies and save money by not doing tests that aren't necessary if we already have the molecular diagnosis. It's at the cusp of this interface between research and clinical care. Over the years, we're gonna see this just explosion in new technologies and new ways of helping these families and children. That does it for us today, but make sure to tune in each day of the meeting as we will be here to bring you all the latest from the 2022 ASHG annual meeting. If you missed any of day one of ASHG TV, we've got you covered. You can always catch the latest episode of ASHG TV on any of the televisions spread throughout the convention center, on the in-house channels at several of our partner hotels, on the homepage of the ASHG website, and of course, always on our YouTube and Twitter channels. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you right back here tomorrow.